Dad's coming up, he's gonna jump. thermocline and how it uh, sets up and how you actually see it and uh, what the factors are that uh, that lead you being able to see it on, on, on your echo sounder and just to give you an understanding of, of what causes it and how the current and all the uh, and bottom structure affects it and what pressure faces are and marine mixing layers are. So we, in this part we'll be discussing pressure faces and bottom structure and how that affects thermocline and how you see thermocline on your echo sounder which is really important because once we get out in the ocean it'll help you understand what you're looking at and then we'll also go on to how you set up your echo sounder to see the thermocline because that's also super important uh, without setting your echo sounder up properly you're not going to get to see this and uh, yeah then you won't be able to to use this information to help you find bullfish but understanding the thermocline and how it works and, um, and how the wind affects it and how the current affects it is super important in helping you um, do better out in the water and to, and to have better results on bullfish, especially in our area of Richards Bay and also um, in the Sodona area. Now, as we spoke in the last video, this is the, this is the image that I showed you of the current, which that was when the south was just starting to blow and push up against the current. Now, I'm going to try and flick through to the other ones, which is a bit difficult <laughs> operating this while I hold this. But that's uh, that's the 22nd, okay, which was two days later after the northeast started to blow again. And you can see this current starting to set all the way in. And this was the day that Steve Andrews and co were out. Uh, there was five boats. I think they raised 19 fish um, amongst them before the wind blew them off and the southerly came again. And... Um, and it's interesting to see that was the day after, which is the 23rd, when the southerly blew them off the ocean again. And you can see how that's broken up already. And you can see that wedge being driven in there, um, sorry, forcing the water back up again. So this situation changes very quickly. Um, what's also of interest is that um, at the beginning of a season, obviously, you're going to get a lot of more fluctuating conditions. And... Um, the, the current will, will come in and, uh, and push down and then you'll have a, a, a southerly hit it and it'll push it back up again and the water will discolor and the fish will disappear. But those early conditions um, in the early part of the season are super important because there's a lot of fish that's coming down in the lead of these current edges and you get a flush of fish which comes down and if you can be out during those periods when you have those good pushes where the current comes down, there are a lot of fish in that, in that lead of that current when it comes down. Obviously, as the season goes on, the northeaster is set in a little bit more and, um, and the pattern will start to become more regular with less amount of fish, but more sort of stable. And then you start getting one or two pulls a day. So, yeah, fishing that pre-season is, is great if you can be in the water in the good conditions. But obviously, it's, uh, it's more difficult because the conditions are much more variable in the early season than they are later in the season. By February, Jan, February... You know, all these still blowing consistently and um, the water's gotten a lot warmer and yeah, the fish less fish, but, but yeah, it's more consistent. Right, so this was the image I showed in the last segment um, of the current, uh, which is on the 22nd of November. And I'm just going to flick through to what it looked like on the 23rd of November. And this was when the northeast came through. Just to show you, and you can see by, the, by how the, the compression which is happening from the northeast, this is still remnants of the southerly being turned around now. You can see the current is being slowly turned back again by the, by the northeaster. And you can see the compression that happens against the coastline. It's less at uh, Sedwana, with one and a half knots, but going up to four or five knots as you go down towards Richards Bay past St. Lucia. And uh, yeah, this is, this is super important for our current and the edges and our thermoclines on our coast. Current. What's really interesting is if you go and look at the wind maps, we have exactly the same thing happen. When the northeaster blows uh, down past uh, Maputo and comes past down the Mozambique Channel, you'll notice if you look at the wind maps, Sedwana always has 10 knots less wind than what we have in this area because of this compression on this little bulge. And the same thing happens with the southwester. We can have 
30 knots, 40 knots of southwest, and Sedwana will only get 20 knots because there's this compression which happens off this this headland here, which which forces the wind through this gap against the against the higher land mass, and it forces this wind through this this area. So we have a lot of current faced with a lot of wind, which makes this area really rough, and uh, yeah, which is very detrimental to our fishing, and and it's such a pity because this area otherwise would be incredible. Right, so here's an example of uh, of what the damage the southwester can do. This is on the 17th of January when you'd expect your current would be setting completely. And we had obviously had a really big southwester just prior to probably on the 16th or 15th of Jan. And you can see what it did to the water. It absolutely destroyed it. And that basically puts an end to your fishing for a few days until your current sets back in again and pushes down. And that's a little bit later, about a week later. And you can see how the current started to set back in again. There's another example of, of water rash after a big southwest. You can see how it's pushed that current right back up again. It's just forced it back up the coast. But great water there, but off St. Lucia and down of Richards Bay, there's absolutely nothing left. It's been absolutely decimated. Right, so here's a progression going back to the 25th of November. These are archival photographs which I've dragged out of the, out of the bush. Um, that's the 25th of, of November. And just to show you how this changes daily, there's your 26th of November and there's your 27th of November. So you can obviously see something has pushed back. There must have been a little bit of southerly, which is, you can see it jamming that current there and pushing it back. And there it's been jammed and pushed all the way back. That's the 28th. So that's over a four day span. And you can see how much it changes daily. So yeah, it makes it a lot more difficult to fish when you've got your, your variables like this. And I've always said that that this area, Richards Bay, Sedona Bay, is, would be comparable to anywhere in the world, and especially Richards Bay, um, for reasons I'll cover a bit later. If we had consistent conditions here, the fact that we have five species of bullfish and that and our size range of the bullfish um, would, would make this one of the standout areas in the world if we had consistent fishing um, and consistent weather, put it that way, which get, would give us consistent fishing. This place would be incredible. So that's your sea surface temperature off Richards Bay. That's actually St. Lucia area. And let's imagine that you were driving out with your boat, uh, leaving the harbour and going out over, over the current. Basically, this is what you're going to see. I'm going to put this here just as an example. So what you've got as you're driving out, that's your boat driving out. Here's your 200 meter and your 500 meter, 1000 meter. As you're going out, this warm water, the purple zone, would be that water lying there, then your red and your orange, which would be a little bit cooler. So you're coming from your cooler water to your warmer water. And these would be the layers of water that would be lying on top of, on top of the ocean. Um, this current doesn't stretch from top to bottom. It only uh, stretches on the, on the surface, as shown here. So it's sort of a half sausage, which then runs along um, the top of the, the cooler water. So as you've been going out, you would hit these layers. This is your marine mixing layer or marine separation zone between the colder water at the bottom and the warmer water, which is less dense, and the cooler water, which is denser. So what your echo sounder shows on low frequency, as you enter that zone, it starts to bounce the signal. Uh, as it's sounding down, the signal starts to bounce off the harder water, the more dense water on the bottom, which then gives you a, a basically a scratchy line, which is your thermocline. And as you drive out, you'll notice that it starts to scratch and then it drops slowly below the boat. And there are several thermoclines um, um, at different levels. And this is something you get used to when you look at it a lot. I'll, I'll speak about that um, more in detail later. But just to understand what the thermocline is. So your thermocline is your marine mixing layer between your warmer water and your cooler water. And what happens, all your nutrients are in your cooler water. So when you have a thermal mixing layer like this, your all the plankton and the small um, organisms tend to collect in this marine mixing layer. And obviously, if they're there, then the, then the predators or the slightly bigger organisms that feed on them will come. And then, of course, the, the bigger marlin obviously chasing the bait fish. These, are, these areas are very important. And, the, and the, the trick is to find the thermocline that's holding the bait. And this is something which you'll, you'll obviously work out in time. And... Um, and obviously with your equipment set well, that you can find the line that's, that's holding the most bait and that will obviously hold um, the most marlin or the most game fish. All right, something else to note is that when you've got a really strong current, your, uh, your 
your depth that the current runs runs at will be greater and the severity of the slope on the in, of your thermocline becomes steeper so if the current's really slow this line is a very gradual line and what you have then is your separation zone or your what i call the the zone becomes great as this water spreads out the zone that you're going to find the fish in becomes spread over a bigger area so it's more difficult to find the fish if you had a stronger current i'm just going to put that in as an example your your uh, your depth of current is going to be deeper your separation zones are going to become smaller and your thermocline will show much steeper so that's a very extreme example it's actually overblown but just to give you an example of what you're going to see on your echo when you have strong current your thermocline dips very quickly whereas as to with uh, a weaker current your thermocline will be at a gradual gradient um, when you've got a westerly blowing up into this current, this may completely disappear. In other words, your or, or your mixing layer becomes spread over a very large area, which is makes it much more difficult to find the fish in those cases. And that's basically what happened um, up at Sidwana and in Richards Bay when the westerly came through on our last visit there. Okay, so here's an example of that thermocline and, and what you'd expect to see. I'm just trying to move the camera to get the glare off the screen. Now this is actually, these are actually pictures of an article which I wrote in 2012, I think it was in the Ski Boat magazine, uh, regarding thermocline. But as you were talking about going out over the current, as you would, as your boat would approach your, your line, this line over here, oops, let me just get that right. This line here, you'd see this starting to scratch on the surface. And then as you went over, over, further over, that line would drop down. And that's basically what you're seeing here. You're seeing the thermocline as the boat moves forward, the thermocline starts to drop down below the vessel. Here we've got some bait in the thermocline, which we'll speak about later. But um, now this is just to give you a picture, and hopefully you'll understand that as you drive over this thermocline, it will drop below the boat. And if you turned around and came the other way, it would then start to rise and come up underneath the boat. And this is, you'd, see, you'd be coming from this direction, your thermocline would come up as you went towards the edge of the current. Right, so now I'm going to talk about uh, structure in the water. And what we're more concerned of um, with current and thermocline, we're talking about water column structure. And what you get along the edges of, this, of, this, uh, of the current line and the edges of your thermocline is where your, where your water is compressed against the cooler water. So we get what, what we call a pressure face. So bottom fishermen and, and marlin fishermen will often talk about a pressure face and they're most times referring to when current hits an obstruction and is forced up to the surface. So in Richards Bay, we have one or two places that both of these uh, pressure faces happen either on the, th on the thermocline or off bottom structure. But at, Rich at um, Sudwana, there's a lot of structure there which will give you pressure faces both on the edge of your thermocline and off uh, bottom structure. And I'll do a diagram of that and show you what I'm talking about. Okay, so I've just got a very small diagram of the canyon or what would it look like at the canyon in at uh, Big W at, at uh, Sedwana. And obviously these are your contours. That's your 200 contour, your 500 contour. And you can see the smaller contours all um, compress into the onto this ridge. This there's a ridge lying above the canyon and a ridge lying below the canyon. So with your current coming down, obviously they're going to hit that ridge. And um, just to show you, okay. So so if you had the current, this is now obviously your bottom, and those are the two ridges. Your current coming up against the ridges, it forces that water upwards, and then you get a pressure face above. Actually, this is a little bit further, it'll be sort of in this area. So this pressure face is due to the current hitting that obstacle and being forced up. So you're compressing your current over a, a top of an obstacle, which makes a venturi. And what you'll find then is you get these compression um, areas or pressure faces and your thermocline shows exactly like I'm showing it there. Um, on your echo sounder and in fact the one on the bottom side closer to Sedwana that pressure face is far greater than than the one on the top side funnily enough there's a lot of thermocline there and there's always a lot of bait in this area so that would be in the area just below uh, the ridge at uh, below the canyon in this area here and obviously guys stretching out to the 500 and obviously all the guys who fish there often you can see the guys work this area a lot um, and the reason why the fish are there is because of this pressure face there and a pressure face here as it hits the ridge. So yeah, these are important. You you get you get pressure faces caused by by um, 
current of obstacles like bottom structure and then obviously your pressure face is caused by by current um, down the down the ledge and compression against the ledge yeah obviously there's a lot of guys out there who understand this um, this is more for the guys who, uh, who who's still new in the game and, and trying to work this out um, and hopefully this gives you a better understanding of of uh, of of the pressure faces and the compression zones that I'm talking about and it'll help you understand more about about uh, what the thermocline looks like once you're out on the boat I'll, I'll talk about it and film it and show you how that all sets up and how it, how it fits in with with what we're seeing on paper here and on the images that we've taken um, off the computer right so if you're enjoying the info on thermocline uh, be sure to subscribe and join us next time on the ocean when we'll put all this information together and I'll show you how this all shows on the echo sounder and how to put it into practice to help you catch uh, better bullfish. Yeah, I'll leave you with the rest of the footage of this big fish that we hooked uh, on a day that I was uh, fishing with uh, Mike and Dale Yenstra looking for records. South African record on 50 pounds. This was a fish which would have pushed close to 800 pounds and unfortunately it got tail wrapped and uh, went down to the bottom. We couldn't stop it and it, we spent a long time on the fish trying to raise it. Unfortunately, just putting too much pressure on eventually and we popped off. Might get a jump shot here. Okay, I'm just going to put some pressure, Mike. This fish is 700. That's, oh, this is bigger. It's bigger. Dale, this fish is a bus. It's a bus, man. This is a donkey, man. This is a bus. This is an absolute bus. Hey! This is a bus. You'll be happy you got those gloves now, China. It's a fucking real one. It's a proper bus, this. Hey, listen. Where's your gaff, China? Where's your gaff? Is it, has it gone into, yeah you got, oh, oh I fucking got it. Oh, this is a freaking nice fish. Woo. Change direction and go into the boat, but tap it, tap it, tap it, tap it if you can. Uh -uh. Tap it, tap it, tap it. Woo! This is a proper.
Tap it, tap it, tap it. There we go, it's tapped. It's coming, it's coming. It's tapped, it's tapped. I think so, bud. Right. This is a proper this. Woohoo! I tell you what, it's a solid fish. It's gonna push eight, I reckon. I haven't seen it now nicely, but. Yeah, well, there we go. Are you going to put some more pressure on it now, Dale? Uh, it's a bus. So stay tuned and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for joining us.